Our program today, coordinated by Randy Prince, takes a look at the open primary top two election system on Oregon's November ballot. The statutory measure will be listed on the ballot as changes general election nomination process provides for single primary ballot listing candidates top to advance. Here's Tom Adams from KVAL to moderate our debate and introduce our speakers. Well, good afternoon, City Club. Thank you for inviting me to uh, take part in this important discussion for this afternoon. I appreciate it. So again, the question before the club uh, today, should Oregonians pass ballot measure 90 and change our election system in Oregon? Now, measure 90, by way of just a very quick background, it's the second attempt to introduce a top two open primary in Oregon in the past six years. If passed, it would replace uh, basically Democratic and Republican primaries with a statewide primary open to all voters and the top two candidates from that primary, regardless of affiliation, would then progress to the November runoff in the fall. A similar initiative did make it to an Oregon ballot uh, back in 2008, Measure 65, but about two-thirds of the voters voted against it in that election. Uh, briefly from uh, the uh, background material from the Yes on 90 side, quote, an open primary system would provide over 650,000 independent voters and hundreds of thousands of voters who live in districts that only elect members of the other party a powerful opportunity to let their voices be heard. Approving the measure on November 4th would help shape the future of our state and national leadership. From the vote on no material, briefly, uh, quoting from the material, despite wide rejection by voters in 2008, a small group of millionaires and corporate CEOs have funded a return of the top two primary measure for this year, 2014. Uh, their measure, the no side says, would dismantle Oregon's primary election system and replace it with a closed general election system. More on that and those arguments coming up. Our panel for this afternoon, among the proponents, Jeremy Rogers, who is vice president of the Oregon Business Council, uh, based out of the Portland area. He has been the vice president of the Business Council since 2005. Before that, Mr. Rogers was the political director of the Oregon Bus Project. Also a proponent, Sal Peralta, Secretary of the Independent Party of Oregon, has joined us today. He is employed by the News Register in McMinnville, where he is a resident. Uh, Sal ran for Yamhill County Commissioner, correct, Sal? I'm running for Yamhill County Commissioner. You are running. <laughs> this past May, he placed uh, first with about, what, 30, 33 percent of the vote. He's headed to a November runoff for Yamhill County Commissioner. Speaking against Measure 90, we have Sarah Logue, a spokesperson for the No on Measure 90 campaign. Uh, she's employed by the Forest Grove School District, been there since 2008. Also on the no side, State Representative Phil Barnhart of Eugene, Democrat, first elected to the State House in 2000. Am I right, Phil? Okay. He's Assistant Democratic Leader and Co-Chair of the House Revenue Committee up in Salem, among other titles. Just to explain our format for today, try to keep us on the straight and narrow here, we'll have uh, opening statements from each of our panelists, four minutes each, and we'll go pro-con, pro-con. After that, we have a, a cross-question segment. We might pause for a minute or two to give each table a, the opportunity to pose a question to the other side of the debate. They have 30 seconds to make their question uh, stated, and then the other side has 90 seconds to provide an answer. After that, then, uh, local e-car entrepreneur Mark Fronmeyer will be the, taking the role of first questioner. Mark himself involved uh, in uh, the, the issue as well this year, so he will pose the first question for our debate. And then we will break for table for all of you to consider some questions at your tables, maybe a, a 10 or 12 minute break, but we'll go off air 
you develop your questions and then we'll reconvene and you uh, appoint a spokesperson at each table to state your questions and then both sides will take turns. We'll both be answering, probably giving them, I'm guessing, 90 seconds each uh, to answer, but we get a huge number of questions. We may cut that back to a 60 second uh, response on both sides. So that's our roughly our format. Oh, closing statements, still have closing statements, two minutes apiece after all that. That is our format. All right, let's go ahead and have uh, opening statements about Measure 90. Mr. Rogers, you would be first. Uh, thank you, Tom, and thank you, Randy, and thank you, City Club of Eugene, for hosting this discussion today. I'd also like to thank Sarah, Sal, and Representative Barnhart for being here to help illuminate uh, uh, all the issues, uh, and most importantly, the, the uh, in-person and radio audience for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, I know this is not as sexy as marijuana or labeling GMO foods, uh, but I hope that by the end of this discussion you will agree that it's equally, if not more, important. Um, so Measure 90 creates a fully open, equitable, and fair election system so that all Oregon voters have the equal ability to select two finalist candidates for the general election. The measure does that by replacing partisan primary elections open only to Democrats and only to Republicans with a single open primary election among all voters and candidates for each office with the top two candidates going on to the general election regardless of party affiliation or lack thereof. Now, I want to explain for a minute how this is different than the system that we have today. For 663,000, the latest numbers from the Secretary of State, Oregonians, including 62,000 here in Lane County, who on their voter registration card chose not to check a box Democrat or Republican, have no ability in the May primary election to vote for the races for U.S. Senate, U.S. Congress, Governor, Secretary of State, State Treasurer, State Senator, State Representative. Those races do not even appear on their May primary ballot. Democrats can only vote for Democrats, and Republicans can only vote for Republicans. Even though in Eastern Oregon it's very likely there is no Democratic candidate on the ballot, and in parts of Portland and Eugene there is no Republican candidate on the ballot, meaning that these voters have no choice either in the primary or the general election. It is virtually impossible under the current system for a candidate not affiliated with any party to make the ballot. They must gather thousands of signatures, it rarely happens. Last midterm election, there was only one candidate for a partisan race not affiliated with any party. And under the current closed system, minor party candidates, while they can make the general election ballot, although not in a taxpayer-funded primary, as the Democrats and Republicans have, they can't win, often end up acting as a spoiler, and uh, whereas Measure 90 creates real meaningful opportunities for minor parties to succeed, and Sal will talk about those later. So the question is, if all taxpayers pay for primary elections and nearly a third of voters prefer something other than checking a box Democrat and Republican, why are we publicly financing a system for two private parties to pick their favorite candidates, often the most partisan candidates, at the exclusion of 663,000 Oregon voters? We don't lock these voters out of elections for mayor or school board. In those elections, we let all voters vote. Why do we lock them out of elections for statewide and legislative offices. I also want to talk a little bit about the coalition that's supporting Measure 90. And I see some faces in the room today and, and many here in Eugene and around the state. Uh, I want to thank Stefan Ostrich from the Working Families Party who's here today. Uh, Working Families Party, one of the fastest growing minor parties in Oregon focused on priorities of middle class Oregonians and families. Mark Fronmeyer, whose leadership helped bring this issue forward and one major reason why we're here today. I'm not sure, don't see him here, but State Senator Chris Edwards. You'll see a statement in the voters pamphlet from him, along with his colleague, Republican Vicki Berger. Uh, many who are not here today, including Governor John Kitzhopper, former Secretaries of State Republican Norma Paulus, and Democrat Phil Kiesling, um, and many others around the state, including uh, business organizations like mine and chambers of commerce around the state. I'm about to get the red, so I'm going to stop right here. So uh, thank you again. We hope that, that you support Measure 90. All right, Sarah Logue, go ahead. Your opening statement, please. Thank you very much for your time today. Um, as you heard, I'm actually a fifth grade teacher uh, in Forest Grove, Oregon. 
um, I learned about Measure 90, and I thought it was actually a really great idea at first. And then when I did some more research, I found out it's not what I hoped it would be. So I'm actually the spokesperson for the Protect Our Vote Coalition, which is the coalition working to defeat Measure 90. Um, in my research, I realized that it wasn't what I hoped it was, uh, and that there are some really terrible flaws in the measure. And so I'm here to make sure that you can make an informed decision. Um, it's a deep and wide issue, and it deserves your attention, so I appreciate your engagement. The great thing about politics is that people have varying opinions. They're not just Republicans or Democrats. We have a strong Green Party, an independent party, Tea Party even. Um, we have establishment folks and we have radical folks. And there are so many facets to our political world. The values people have are different and how people approach voting is different. Some people vote in every race, no, mat and, um, no matter what, and some only vote in the races that they know or who they, uh, for someone who they know may win. The reason why Measure 90 is so dangerous is that it decides for all of us what kind of choices and what kind of voter we get to be. If you like to vote for Democrats in a conservative district, you lose out in Measure 90. If you ever want to write somewhere, someone in, you lose out under Measure 90. And when I vote on my ballot, I like to write people in, and it gives me a voice. Measure 90 eliminates that. The perfect example um, for a catch-22 vote options that Measure 90 creates are in Washington's Congressional District uh, number four right now. As you may know, in Washington, they do have a top two system. Um, in District 4 right now, they have two very conservative candidates. In the primary election there in District 4, only 20% of the population participated in that primary vote. And there are two candidates that are very similar in platform right now. Both are against a woman's right to choose. Both are against um, Ob Obamacare. Both are very fiscally um, similar in their philosophies. Um, one raffled off a rifle to raise campaign funds, and another one is a Monsanto spokesperson. They're very, very similar. If I were living in that district, if I were one of the 80,000 people who voted democratically in 2012, I would not have a candidate who represented my values on the ballot, and I may disengage. We've seen top two engagement and voter participation fall, um, fall in, even in top two states, um, along with the national trend. I'm frustrated, along with a lot of other people, with our current political system. Our system is far from perfect. But rather than tinkering around the edges with rules like this, I think our most central challenge for our democracy is to get more people participating. In order to confront that issue, we need to remove barriers to participation. We need to register people to vote and dedicate more resources to registering and re-registering young voters in particular. We can reform the system so we have automatic voter registration updates. When someone changes their address, it should automatically update their voter registration as well. We could also allow same-day voter registration. We were one vote away from having this change in the legislature, but many of the groups that support Measure 90 opposed automatic voter registration. The other big challenge is to get big money out of politics. That's the real problem we face. Replacing our primary system will not change things for the better. It won't make a lot of change in general. The piece we need to continue to figure out is how do we get the billions and billions of dollars from just a few folks out of politics? There are some serious ideas to create a public financial model, financing model, like they have in New York State, that could promote a different kind of candidate. That's the kind of change that our state needs. The reason why those ideas aren't on the table is because the proponents of Measure 90 are not actually interested in election reform. They're interested in creating elections that produce a certain style of candidate, one that meets their own special business needs. So it's up to us to evaluate, and it's up to you to choose today. Does this system lead to more choice and participation when it matters, or fewer choices and less participation? I'm hopeful that we'll have a good discussion today about the details of Measure 90, and that I get to ch a chance to tell you about how it limits your choice, how it's backed by special interests, and how it's deeply flawed. Okay, Sarah, thank you. Sal? Well, I, I agree with everything that Sarah had to say about the need for voter uh, engagement, voter involvement, and I agree uh, strongly with same-day registration and several of the other reforms that she proposed. Nothing in Measure 90 would prevent us from doing all of those things in the state legislature. Uh, when any time we get into a legislative context and there's a legislative fight, the opponents of change create an environment of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. This reform is going to change things in a bad way. It creates unintended consequences. Oh my goodness, the sky is going to fall. But in this case, Oregonians already vote under a system that is very similar to the top two primary. 
Every time we vote in a nonpartisan race in this state, we are essentially voting in a top two primary. Every single time, every single voter has an opportunity to influence votes at the city level, votes at the county level, in counties that are currently nonpartisan. Uh, I'm a member of a minor political party. I noticed that Sarah passed around uh, information about how this will affect some of the minor political parties in the state. I think I'm the only person in, at the table here today who has been involved and engaged in minor political party politics. I strongly favor this measure. This measure will substantially benefit minor political parties. I would like to say that uh, I believe that the main reason why the political establishment in this state, and let's be clear, the most powerful political establishment members in this state oppose this measure. The Democratic Party opposes it, the Republican Party opposes it, Oregon Right to Life opposes it, and the biggest political spenders in this state, including groups that oppose reforming Citizens United, including groups that oppose campaign finance reform that I helped to put on the ballot in 2006, these groups have all come out against this measure, and why? Why? Because they don't want a system that is going to change uh, a, a system that creates the most partisan outcomes and a system that they can control. And make no, no bones about it, this measure is about control. This is about groups trying to ensure that the most partisan candidates get elected in the 80% of the districts in this state where there is no choice. There is only the illusion of choice in 80% of the districts in this state. In, if you're in inner Eugene, if you're in inner Portland, if you're in Ashland, if you're in Corvallis and you happen to be a Republican, you only have the illusion of choice on the, on the general election ballot today. If you're a Democrat living in Yamhill County where I'm from, or if you live in Eastern Oregon, you only have the illusion of choice on the ballot. Now, uh, I've heard opponents say, well, this measure's terrible because uh, you might have two Republicans competing against each other. I see Mark Fronmeyer is here today. Uh, Dave Fronmeyer is one type of Republican. Art Robinson is another type of Republican. The current system rewards the Art Robinsons and punishes the Dave Fronmeyers. And I think that is a problem. That is a problem that every voter uh, needs to recognize that we have only the illusion of choice on the ballot, and that needs to change. Now, how is this going to help minor political parties? Uh, the first way is the biggest obstacle to growth for minor political parties is the fact that people re-register to vote with a major party when the primary election comes. The Pacific Green Party almost got decertified in uh, 2008 because they lost a third of their membership who, who joined the Democratic Party to vote in that primary election. This measure is an empowerment act for minor political parties, and frankly, I am offended that, that they are making the argument that this harms minor political parties. There are one or two minor political parties that will have their ballot access threatened, not removed, but because they'll have the opportunity to grow, this system will benefit them. And they'll be able to set up one-on-one -on -one races. As a member of the Independent Party, every time we've been able to set up a one-on-one -on -one race against Democrats and Republicans, we get 40% of the vote, we get 45% of the vote. We haven't gotten over the hill yet, but we're going to, and we're going to soon, and this measure will help us do it. Thank you. Okay. Phil, your opening statement, please. Thank you, uh, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to speak in front of this uh, group today. As a City Club member, I'm, I'm always pleased to be here and, and participate in the conversations about public policy matters. Uh, the, uh, the, the, current, uh, I, I, the, the, the current ballot measure before us has some significant flaws that are important for you to understand. And it's important to understand them because it's important to recognize that trying to make any fixes in those flaws later may be very, very difficult or impossible. I don't know whether these things are drafting errors, whether they were done intentionally uh, or, or what. I do know that uh, when a measure, when a, an important election measure uh, goes through the legislature, it's very carefully vetted and the words are very carefully reviewed uh, at, at, at least two different committees uh, that, are, that work uh, almost exclusively on election matters until the end of the session, the two rules committees. We don't have time in a, in a process for a court to tell us what an, an election measure means. When you get into an election controversy about the law and what it means, you're, you're in trouble immediately. That, that tends to uh, cause disrespect for our electoral process and uncertainty, which I think is a real problem. In this case, we're talking about the, the potential reality that if a person receives a 50% 50, 50 plus one uh, votes in the primary election, there won't be a general election because of the references that this measure makes to existing law. 
If that had been the case uh, in if that had been the case in this primary, I would not face an opponent in the general election uh, because uh, I was the only name on the on the ballot. Nobody nobody else had filed. As it is under the current law, I do have an opponent because a Republican won the Republican write-in and is now running uh, the race. Now I hope to I hope to win the election. You understand, but the point is that there are substantial numbers of people in my district who would prefer a Republican uh, win that race, and they have the choice in the November election now under the, under the measure they would not. Probably the most important uh, problem is the one that uh, Saul, uh, Mr. Peralta talked the most about, and that is the problems with the minority parties. I think it's clear when you look at the, uh, uh, the legal interpretations of this measure that the odds of this measure destroying the minor parties in Oregon is very substantial and very real. Another issue that I think is very important for us to talk about is the way this measure could, under some circumstances, destabilize the legislature and essentially make a mockery of an election in, in, a, in a strong uh, 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 partisan seat in one direction or the other. Uh, Lane County has four Republican uh, commissioners. Uh, almost all of the legislative seats are held by Democrats. Under this rule, if uh, if the, uh, this measure is adopted, the, I'm not saying they would do this, but the Republican commissioners could appoint a Republican or a non-affiliated voter to represent a highly Democratic district. There are circumstances in the middle of a session with the right uh, voting count in the legislature where you could end up with a new speaker, uh, a, new, uh, a new committee chair for the budget committee, a whole new effort to, make, uh, uh, to, to write the budget and do the other things that the legislature needs to do and destabilize the legislature when it has an absolute limit on the number of days it can meet. Uh, I think it's very clear that what this measure does is limit the, uh, the rights of voters to express their personal opinions in the general election uh, and it's in that, for that reason, it is fatally flawed and should be defeated. I appreciate the time. Thank you very much. All right, and that's opening statements. Now we're going to move into a, what we call a cross-question segment. Uh, panelists, do you need a little bit of time to formulate? Okay, all right. We'll maybe take about one minute, get your question together. Uh, I'm fine with them leaving. Yeah. Hmm? Go ahead. Oh, okay, I'm paused. Okay, um, go ahead, Sarah. So the money to support your measure is coming from CEOs and big business special interests. What are those special interest groups hoping to get out of Measure 90? I think that, that the CEOs and the other groups that are supporting this are hoping to get better government out of Measure 90. I think we have a government at all levels that is divided along partisan lines, that is failing to meet the basic needs of this state. And frankly, I also think it's a little bit offensive for, for the proponents of this who are also fueled by big money supporters, let's be clear about that, to be attacking people like Peter Boyles, who's donated hundreds of millions of dollars to charity in this state, who is a good employer in this state. And I, I just, I don't think it's fair. I think I can recognize that it's a, a convenient strategy to poison the well by saying, well, these people are just out to get, get something that, uh, that, that, that is nefarious. But in fact, they are trying to protect the current system. The, 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 the no side is trying to protect the current system. And I personally don't feel that this current system works very well for minor political parties. I don't think it works very well for non-affiliated voters. And in terms of policy outcomes, I think that the current system is failing to meet the basic challenges that we face as a country. Our two parties are far too divided today, and we need to change the direction of that. If we don't start changing the direction of that with this house divided between the two parties that engage in this power play with millions of dollars on negative campaigning and millions of dollars on, on tearing down the other guy, that makes it very difficult to come back and, and work together as one collaborative body. And, and if you look at what's happening in Washington, D.C., it is a failure of partisanship, and the current system rewards partisanship, and it needs to change. Okay, proponents, uh, what, what is your question for the other side? Yeah. Um, thank you. So the opposition to this measure uh, includes both major parties, uh, as Sal mentioned earlier, Oregon Right to Life, and the largest government employee unions in Oregon. And those groups are spending a significant amount of money 
to defeat the measure. Um, and last time around, at the same issue, uh, the same funders, and including donors, business donors that were bigger than business donors to this side. So my question is, what, what is it that those organizations are trying to protect that are organizations that are extremely powerful on the left and the right of the political spectrum? Thank you for your question. I appreciate it. Um, to be clear, we have a large coalition that is wide and deep. And when you look at our list of coalition partners, we represent hundreds of thousands of Oregonians and their differing interests. When you look at the list of proponents for Measure 90, they represent hundreds of thousands of dollars and very narrow interests for very few. Okay, all right, that's our cross-question segment. Next, uh, Mr. Mark Frohnmeyer is uh, going to step up with uh, his role as first questioner today. A little quick disclaimer, Mark, you are a proponent yeah, of Measure I 90. Actually did, I, I led the drafting of Measure 90, uh, as it turns out, um, although the core draft itself was written by the state's legislative council. So uh, when we're talking about drafting errors, I mean, the, the people who wrote this measure are the people who write the laws on behalf of our legislators. Uh, and one of the things that they told us, and this is just a little bit of backstory before I dive into the question, is that in order to actually fully implement this concept, it would be hundreds of pages of election reform uh, law, which is completely impractical to petition by citizen initiative. So, uh, so we actually asked the legislature to refer a complete set of those code amendments to the ballot. That effort, uh, so, you know, sort of basically went nowhere within the rules committee. And so we petitioned not that full set of amendments, but rather what the Legislative Council themselves described as the broad overarching policy. And at the root of that broad overarching policy is a super crisply worded statement of intent. And that statement of intent says, it's time for all of us to be equal in the vote, that all the voters, regardless of political party affiliation, should have the opportunity to have equal participation both in the selection of two finalist candidates and then in the selection of the winner for the office. And, and that, that concept of political equality, that actually predates the entire founding of the country. This is something that Madison wrote into Federalist number 57, who are to be the electors, not the rich more than the poor, not the learned more than the ignorant, not the haughty heirs of distinguished names more than the humble sons of obscurity and unpropitious fortune. It's to be everybody. Uh, and the, the Supreme Court has traced that concept of equality uh, all the way back to Federalist number 57 when they came up with the principle of one person, one vote. They said everyone's vote is to carry an equal weight. Uh, and in that concept of equal weight, the, the, the real question that I have is if we divide... This is the question. If we divide our voters by political party first, and in 75% of our districts, we provide one party with such a dominant advantage that whoever wins the primary election in that district always wins the general election. And if we have a mechanism within our election process where if you like two candidates on the ballot and I like one, because we limit you to one choice, everyone who thinks like you has half of the weight of everyone who thinks like me. How can we call our current election system equal for the voters. So, you know, we went first to the legislature to ask for a, a clean and full referral. That went nowhere. So we petitioned it to the ballot to ask the voters to direct the legislature to make those changes. Okay. Now, the question I have for all the panelists is, in the event that the measure passes, will you fight your darndest to make sure that that statement of intent is fully realized? And conversely, if it does not pass, what will you do, what will you advocate, in order that the voters actually be equal in all elections? Okay, 90 seconds each side. Okay. Yes, I, I think that's a, that's a very fair question. The, uh, the answer to the first part of the question, uh, if the measure passes, one thing that's very important to be aware of is that when uh, the people vote on a measure and pass it, the legislature is not going to play with the major uh, components of that measure. And I think the clear example of that is Measure 47, the property tax uh, measure, they, they, which was fatally flawed in the way it was constructed. The legislature referred Measure 50, 
which had exactly the same uh, basic plan in it, but it was redrafted so it would actually work. Uh, so do not expect that the legislature will make any, if this measure passes, do not expect that they'll make any significant changes in the mechanisms that are being proposed in the measure. I think that would be unlikely. Um, what will we do if the measure doesn't pass? Uh, Representative Hoyle, the majority leader and chair of the Rules Committee has already proposed that we adopt a plan like the New Hampshire plan in which uh, non-affiliated voters uh, may choose to vote in a partisan primary uh, of their choice uh, at, at the uh, time of the, part of the primary election. Uh, it's working fine in New Hampshire. I think it's working in other states as well. Um, and that measure, of course, will be properly drafted. The uh, Legislative Council drafts measures on the basis of what they're asked to draft by the proponents. The, the determination as to whether the measure is actually adequate and will actually do what you want is a, is a matter of conversation and discussion in the legislature, which, of course, in a primary, uh, in, a, in an initiative situation, uh, doesn't happen because of the nature of the, of the initiative. Okay. Thank you, Representative Barnhart. Proponents, answer. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, we think this measure needs to pass. Um, and, and frankly, I do not believe that the legislature will do anything about this issue uh, because it has to pass the legislative body uh, it, it, to be enacted. And this trend has been going on for years, the increase in voters shifting away from the parties. It's at a peak at 663,000, 31% of voters. It was 19% of voters in the early 90s. Nothing has been done to fix that. And also, I would say, Washington State, they did a poll after the new system was passed, voters preferred the open, fully open, pick any candidate you like system, 76%. Only 20% of voters said they liked the old system where they had to pick a party. If I could just chime in, uh, I have spent the last four years trying to get the legislature to treat minor parties more fairly than they treat them today. Uh, in response to those efforts, the legislature has come up with a death penalty bill for my party. They have refused to even consider legislation to allow minor parties to opt into the state party election. And if you listen closely to what Representative Barnhart had to say, the plan that the majority leader and the speaker signed on to still leaves minor political parties out in the cold. This is about maintaining control and maintaining power. It's very easy to offer an alternative reform or an alternative strategy when there is something else on the table. But believe me, the only reason they're even talking about any of this is because they are worried that this measure is that voters are going to take power back from the political parties by enacting this measure. That's what they're afraid of, and they should be afraid. OK, Nancy Oft Rose, City Club member. And this should be a short question. I want to know how this is going to affect federal elections, both at the state level and at the national level. And one thing concerns me, a former member of this club, now deceased, Tony Nathan, was the very first woman to run as a vice presidential candidate in this country. And I, I think you people all ought to know that, but I don't want things like that to not be able to happen. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. I think, yeah. I think that's a great, a, a great question. I think that the effect on federal elections, at least for Congress, will be very similar to the effect uh, on more local elections like for the state legislature. The reality is that we have districts in Oregon like District 2 where it, uh, the, the two past the post system like this one will always nominate two Republicans. As it is now, we have a, a Democratic candidate over there who is, let's be fair, unlikely to win. On the other hand, she is presenting a, a set of positions which are very important to be discussed that are very important to be heard, and that, w and that may actually persuade voters to switch their views on, 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 an, on an election or over a series of time. Part of what elections are is a public debate about public policy. Part of what's really important about them is that we have differences of opinion and that we, have, we express different ideas. And the, 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 the static uh, view of, in short term, District 2 is always going to be Republican, is probably not true. If people are allowed the opportunity, when the voters are paying attention at general election time, to actually have a big discussion about the big issues, that requires that you have, in a district like District 2, you have a Republican candidate, probably the incumbent, and a Democratic candidate who will clearly express the different points of view and what that, the effect that has on people, 
on the economy, on schools, and on a whole variety of other issues, including foreign policy and the other issues that you ask about. Okay, proponent side. Thanks. So this, uh, Jeremy Rogers, a uh, uh, proponent from Measure 90. Uh, so just at a basic level, uh, just to make it clear that the, the uh, Measure 90 affects U.S. Senate and congressional elections, does not affect uh, races for U.S. President. Um, and uh, the experience in California and Washington has been, in the vast majority of races, uh, there's still a Democrat and a Republican running against each other. But I just disagree with the uh, assessment of Representative Barnhart about what that means if you have uh, two Democrats or two Republicans running against each other in, say, in, in, say in, a, in a congressional election. Um, all Democrats are not the same, all Republicans are not the same, and parties are not the only vehicle for which we express our values and our ideas. As Sal mentioned earlier, there's a difference between Dave Fronmeyer and Art Robinson. Those differences are real, and those are healthy differences to promote inside the party as well. So uh, I was at a conference in Washington, D.C. The lead, one of the lead Politico reporters for Politico uh, was there. He said if every state adopted a top two primary, we would not have had the government shut down. And I agree with that. And the only way we're going to change Congress is state by state to change the way we elect people instead of electing the most partisan candidates, electing the candidates that are supported by the most voters. Thank you. Next questioner from the City Club, state your name. Rob Zako, City Club member. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, we know that fewer people participate in primary rather than general elections. It would seem that both the traditional primary system and the uh, proposed open primary system actually limit our choices because only two or a few people advance to the general election when more people vote. Why not make it simple and just have an open general election and everybody can run in the general election and we have the most choices that way. Everybody can vote for anyone. And if there's a concern about not having a majority of people vote for the winner, you can use something like instant runoff voting. Thank you. Okay. Proponent side, you can lead this one. Sure. So, I, J Jeremy Rogers, proponent of Measure 90. Um, the value of winnowing down the field of candidates is a significant value of a primary election, which then allows for a crisp debate between two candidates in the general election. Um, that's a very important purpose. Unfortunately, the way that it works right now is that that purpose serves a private party rather than serving a public purpose. Under the new system, it serves the public purpose of winnowing down the field to two candidates who then compete crisply on the issues in the general election. Right now, that only happens inside the party, and it's about picking a Democrat and picking a Republican. So I think that keeping the, the uh, ability to winnow the, the candidates for a more crisp data is a, is, a, is a critical part of our election system. Okay, Sarah? Thank you, um, and thank you, Rob, for your question. I do agree that Measure 90 limits choice. Um, there are six different primary systems currently in our nation, and this is the only one that limits choice in the general election. Um, it's a deep concern of mine. Um, in our general election ballots, when we have multiple candidates, um, more than two, we have minor parties represented, we have all sorts of folks represented, and we have wide conversations getting ready for that general election when our voters are engaged. We know that no matter what primary system you use, um, that voters really turn out in the general and that, that who votes in the primaries is pretty much the same. In Oregon, for example, our 16 over population represents about a quarter of our population, but they do represent 58% of the primary election vote. So knowing how uh, that group is magnified in voice in the primary and how our general election is really when the most of our populace is engaged I think it's most important to have that wide choice in the general election where everyone can find someone on the ballot that best represents their personal values Okay, thank you next question Roz Stein City Club member um, in our table we had a discussion where and I hope I'm reflecting everybody's um, thoughts that we're still not sure exactly why this, the, the pro side is really, what's really beneficial about it. I, I said, because I think to myself, well, if, if two people get elected in the primary and either both Republicans, both Democrats, or one Republican, one Democrat, well then in the general election, the, the minor parties are just totally out of the picture. That, keeps coming back to me. So we want to know, again, maybe reiterate why, it, why you think this is important. 
non-supporters go first. Oh, we did, yeah. I'm trying to alternate. Yes, I appreciate it. <laughs> it, it it's hard to answer the question that she <laughs> asked from our side. Um, Ross, thank you for your question. I appreciate you bringing that up. We are concerned about minor parties, as the, the handout that you received clearly indicates. Um, minor parties almost never make it on the November ballot in a top two system, such as California and Washington have. They only make it on the ballot when fewer than two major party candidates are on that primary ballot. Um, we understand the negative impacts uh, based on loopholes and um, party status that are in Measure 90, and we're deeply concerned. Oregon has a great culture of vivid minor parties, um, and we want to make sure their voices are clearly heard. Do you have anything to add, Phil? Well, I, I, I think that's the, this is Phil Barnhart, I think that's the key point. Under the current system, it is possible for a minor party to nominate someone, and it goes back to the answer I gave to the previous question. The time when people, when voters are paying attention to an election in our current system starts about the middle of September, before the general election. That's when the public debate occurs. People are busy in their lives, they're doing other things, but during that period of time, more citizens are actually paying attention to basic public policy issues. When you have the opportunity to vote for minor party candidates, candidates from the major parties, uh, candidates who, uh, who have gotten in in some other way, doing your own write-in, that's how we develop the political uh, perspective for the long haul. It may, it may or may not affect this election, but it will have an effect over the long haul on how America thinks about these basic public policy issues. And I submit that that's as important as the specific outcome of a specific race. Okay, proponents? The current system has locked minor parties out for 100 years. No minor party candidate has been elected to a partisan race for 100 years in this state. And the biggest effect of minor party candidacies on the ballot is typically to throw the election to the side that they are least aligned with. Uh, it is very discouraging for minor political parties, as the only member of a minor political party on this stage, to have candidates appear on the general election ballot only to get one and two percent of the vote. It limits the ability of the minor party to grow. This provision allows us to cross-nominate uh, major party candidates, which the independent party has been doing for years to good effect and allowed us to build political power uh, in the state. Also because uh, the uh, political parties will no longer be nominating people to the ballot, but instead will be endorsing people to the ballot, this will give minor parties the potential to have an actual voice in Salem. We can have minor party caucuses since we will be endorsing equally with major party candidates. Uh, I would also speak to the, uh, to the issue of races in Washington and California. Minor political parties have done fairly well in both Washington and California, both in congressional and state legislative races, and they have an opportunity to actually perform better in the general election because they're now going to have an ability to compete head-to-head -head in districts that are traditionally gerrymandered. If you look at inner Eugene, a Pacific Green Party candidate versus a, a Democratic candidate might be a much better reflection of the will of that district than a Democrat and a Republican, for example. So I think this is, as I said, the Minor Party Empowerment Act. I strongly favor it uh, on those grounds. Okay. Next question. Hi, my name is Steve Coatsworth. Uh, since I got a whole minute, I'll just say that uh, I, I was uh, a non-affiliated voter until about 22, and uh, and and luckily there's a structure like uh, the Democratic Party, which I became involved with, that is civically engaged in a way that I don't see of those who are not engaged with a political party. Um, I, I really appreciate that, especially coming from West Eugene, where people are holding down three jobs to, just to hold up their children, and really need to identify and have the freedom to associate. Um, but uh, what, what I would say is, is sort of riffing off of what, um, what Sarah was saying, which is that I did my research. Initially, I was in support of this, but I did my research, and I've looked all around the country, and what you see is lower voter turnout and, and um, lower, uh, in particular, and that's not across the board, but in particular, lower voter information and a larger influence of dollars. And I think that Sarah couldn't have put it better when she said that what this does, and the only counterbalance to that is our ability to associate and to, sorry, the question, the question, question. is, why did you choose the, the worst system that sort of lobotomizes our ability to have choice in a general election? And, and, and that limits our ability. 
Sorry. <laughs> I'll just read from things. So there are, there are six types of primary election systems used in the United States, and I'm curious why the proponents of Measure 90 have chosen this system in particular, because as far as I can tell, it does the most to squash our ability to choose to associate and choose our candidates in a primary, and then put them up against one another in a general election. Okay, Sal or Jeremy? Uh, Sal Peralta. Uh, the uh, the first point I'd make is the comment that this this actually increases the influence of money. The only reason why the cost of elections increases under the open primary systems in both Washington and California is that more districts are competitive than was the case previously. Uh, and I would actually argue that the current system rewards the influence of money because when you have 80 percent of the districts or 90 percent of the districts that are uncontested, it allows all of the big money to flow into the remaining 10 to 15 percent. It's much easier for a small number of groups to control 10 percent of the races or 15 percent of the races than it is for them to control if they have to compete in 40 or 50 percent of the districts. And I think that's one of the main reasons why the big money players in the state oppose this measure because it will actually weaken their ability to control the legislative process with money because right now what we have is a system where 80 percent of the districts are uncompetitive and the most partisan candidate in the primary election, an election that only maybe 15 percent of the voters are going to participate in, a Democratic primary or Republican primary, 80 percent of those districts are going to reward the most partisan primary candidate. In the remaining districts, the big money players come in and they control the spending in those elections, which rewards people who are loyal to their agendas. And the way to get big money out of politics is to weaken their ability to control our elections through the use of money and through the spending of money. This system does that. I'm not claiming that it's a panacea, but it is a huge step forward. And if I may say before I'm, I'm forced to stop, uh, I plan on switching to decaf after the debate. <laughs> <laughs> Other side, please. Uh, well, thank you for your question. Um, I, I would agree with you. I glad, I'm glad that we've had kind of parallel journeys, so to speak, with uh, Measure 90. Um, I would just reiterate that when a minority of the population has the majority of an influence over who we can vote for, it's a bad sign for our democracy. I would also say that if uh, th this measure you know, proposes to change our election system, and any time we change our political system to create a specific outcome, uh, we've damaged our democracy and silenced the voices of the representative people. Phil Barnhart, um, I, I would simply add to that that one of the other methods uh, that you mentioned is the one that we're talking about putting in uh, in the in the uh, in the legislature next year, the New Hampshire approach uh, to it that I've already described. Uh, I want to respond to the the comment that was made earlier by the proponents that the legislature doesn't act. Uh, I think the reality is that when a measure like this comes up twice, as it has in the last six years, uh, the legislature's uh, attention is focused on the issue. I fully expect that the legislature will act on the set of issues that, we, uh, that this measure raises, though with a very different answer if the measure is defeated. Um, and more, more likely, the answer that is proposed by uh, the majority leader. Uh, the, the other thing that I think is critically important is that the actual experience in, in, in these kinds of elections with the proposed measure in the two states that are using it now is that voter turnout actually declines in primaries and that costs actually go up. Uh, the opposite of what uh, they propose. Okay, I'm getting the signal we should go to shorter answers because we're getting sh low on time here. Bob? Bob Cassidy, City Club member. I see this measure as being a referendum on the two-party system that we kind of claim this country is two-party system. Actually, there are 14 different parties registered in different states. What what happened just recently in the state of Kansas, and we just heard about this, they, they had the two-party system and an independent, and the Democratic Party looks like they're going to lose, so they asked the Democrat to pull off the ballot so that maybe the independent could run. That may not work out because they're saying he can't take his name off the ballot once he's declared it is on. There has been so much restriction on third parties being, becoming functioning in a ballot system. So how would this really curb that problem? And I, I guess I'm directing that to you. Would this uh, measure 90 uh, to the proponents uh, curb that kind of problem going on? Well, it, it, you, do you mind if they go first? Sorry. Oh, uh, Representative Barnhart. Uh, look, the, the, the key issue 
uh, in, this, in this situation is that if you want to avoid having a, a, an election in which uh, the top two in a, in a district which w would be tending to vote for, for a candidate of a different party, if you want to prevent that from happening, you have to make certain that the number of candidates on your side is small. Uh, in California, uh, there were two Republican nominees for a district if, to the United States Congress that a Democrat normally wins. Why was that? Because uh, there were four Democratic candidates who ran in that district. So it behooves the, the party then that wants to protect the potential of actually winning a seat to actually go and limit the number of candidates running in the primary uh, and, and reducing the, uh, the, the conversation at that time. So. This, this approach that is being proposed here is not a panacea at all. It actually probably, in the long run at least, will increase the uh, power of the, of the party bosses, if you will, but not decrease it. Okay. We're going to one-minute answers. Go ahead. I, I find it ironic that the party bosses in their entirety are opposing this measure if it would actually enhance their power. Uh, I don't think that's the case. I think that this weakens their power. It takes the nominating power out of the hands of party bosses and puts it in the hands of all the people equally. And that is a reform that is long past due if you believe that the current structure of government is not working. The current structure of government is not working in part because the um, system by which we elect candidates is rewarding the most partisan outcomes. Uh, with respect to the question of whether this will benefit minor parties, as I said, I would not be up here if I did not believe that this will not substantially strengthen minor political parties in the state. It will cause some parties to be a little more strategic. Uh, right now, it'll, the Green Party, for example, runs candidates that, that get 1 to 2 percent, and they're perfectly fine with that strategy. Under this proposal, they'll have to concentrate their efforts in state legislative districts, and I think they'll okay. be able to, uh, to actually make some inroads in a way that they have not been able to previously. Okay, thanks. Do we have time for another question? Or how are we doing? I, I am very sorry to our club members. We have to move on to uh, closing statements, and we, we had a debate on who was supposed to go first, and I'm sorry we didn't work this out in advance. I don't want tomatoes thrown back and forth here <laughs> on who goes last. <laughs> Let's go ahead. Let's have the proponents lead off here on closing statements, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sal Peralta. I'm the Secretary of the Independent Party of Oregon. I've been involved in minor political party politics uh, for the last uh, eight years. Uh, I have grown increasingly concerned about the direction that our country is headed. We have become more partisan. Our institutions are losing the faith of the governed. They are not responding adequately to the major issues of the day. And I believe that some of that, at least, has to do with the system of elections that we have adopted. Uh, when major political parties typically act towards minor political parties, they have typically acted to restrict ballot access, to make it more difficult to run for office. And as I mentioned, in, in the case of the Independent Party of Oregon, they actually attempted a death penalty bill against our party when it became clear that we were growing faster than it made some of them comfortable. And so any time a minor party begins to emerge that threatens the dominant two-party structure, they crack down in much the same way that they're cracking down on this top two open primary measure. Uh, the goal of, proponent, of the opponents of this measure is to create fear, uncertainty, and doubt in the minds of voters. Uh, I can tell you once again that most voters already vote using a very similar system to this top two system. Uh, when you vote in nonpartisan elections, you're essentially voting in a top two election. This is not some dramatic, wild-eyed reform. It is a prudent reform that is supported by the most nonpartisan politicians in the state. Phil Kiesling, Norma Paulus uh, have been wonderful secretaries of state among the least partisan people that we've in, uh, elected. I think that this will help to, yield, uh, to create better policy outcomes by helping to elect more moderate candidates. I come from a very specific point of view, that one that believes that we need more Dave Fronemeyers and fewer Art Robinsons in public life, and uh, this helps to move it in that direction, and I ask for your support in November. Opposing side, two minutes. Sarah Logue, Protect Our Vote Coalition, No. 90. 
Uh, I want to thank you for your time and your engagement today. I do apologize we couldn't get to the last two questions, and I'm happy to answer your questions individually after uh, the program is com complete. Um, I just want to point out that the Independent Party of Oregon, I think, has uh, differing views depending on the, who you talk to. I know that Dan Meek, one of the founders of the Independent Party in Oregon, strongly opposes Measure 90 and has spoken out against it on many occasions. Um, I think one of the critical issues in Measure 90 is the illusion of choice of two very similar candidates running against each other, as we've seen in District 4 uh, in Washington, and real choice, which is having a wide span of values on the general election ballot for all voters to look at and identify with. Um, I would also like to um, just reiterate that I feel that Measure 90 does limit choice um, for our voters when we are engaged in the general election and um, special interests are pushing this. I, I still didn't get a clear uh, indicated answer about what's in it for them. Um, I, I don't really trust their, um, their wish at reform when they're using dishonest tactics um, and deceit. I don't know if you guys have heard, there were, there's a fake website, there's a fake No on 90 website right now that the proponents of Measure 90 have put out. Uh, the caption on that website is keeping the riffraff out of our elections. And I personally don't trust people who would retort to those sorts of um, tools to really be the ones who are reforming our elections. Um, lastly, I would consider the flaws in Measure 90 plentiful. Um, as a teacher in the state of Oregon, I know our legislature has faced challenges to fund our schools and in a variety of other ways. I personally don't feel that um, I want to pass a measure which, which, with so many flaws and just cross my fingers and hope that the legislature would reform it in a way that best suits my needs. Thank you for your time. All right, and that's our debate on Measure 90. Thanks to the panelists for a thorough discussion of the issue. and. Um, Marty gets the last word.